about a year ago, God started moving on my heart about uh, a message that I was to give. It's actually uh, several years in, in coming. And I knew that God wanted me to speak on the family and the dynamic that he had established, uh, the relationship that he desires for husbands and wives, parents and children, uh, even siblings. Um, and there, But there was a particular topic that he wanted me to talk about, and, and I, I want to share with you this morning, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay. But I also do not want to be faithless. And there are certain topics in the church today that we avoid. For, for whatever reason, we, we just... Uh, tend not to talk about them. And we have been working through uh, the family relationships, specifically husbands and wives. Uh, we looked at how God established them in Genesis, how sin corrupted that relationship. We've seen throughout other passages in Scripture the outcome of uh, the sin and how it plays out. Um, and I need to talk today about something that uh, it isn't going to make you feel good. Okay? And, I, and it's not intended to make you feel good. So before I get into today's message, I want to share something with you that I want you to hold on to. Okay? Romans 8.1 says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay. You, you need to grab hold of that. You need to rest that God's son's sacrifice was sufficient uh, chapter, a couple chapters earlier, Paul is speaking to the Romans in chapter 5, uh, verses 20 and 21. He's talking about the nature of the new covenant. And in verse 20 he says, Now the law, which was the previous covenant, came in to increase the trespass. It's not sin if you don't know it's sin. The law came in to make us aware that we were sinners. Every one of us. Okay? Scripture says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Scripture also says there is no one righteous, not even one. Okay, so we're all in the same boat. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Okay? God's grace will always exceed our sin. Okay? That's, that's the sufficiency of His grace. It doesn't matter if your sin could fill a teaspoon a gallon, an ocean. God's grace will always supersede your sin. Okay? So having said that, uh, hold on to that. Because I was doing some research and we're talking about divorce. This is a difficult subject for me to talk about because I am the byproduct of divorced parents. My mom and dad were both married previously to their marriage to each other. And because of their marriage to each other, I'm here. Okay. So, I was looking at statistics 
And honestly, I don't know who they interview to come up with this information. I know I have never been interviewed. I don't know of anyone that has been interviewed to come up with these numbers. Um, probably I was not interviewed because when they tell me they're doing a survey, I tell them I'm not interested. Thank you. Okay. So here's a, a quote from uh, the United States Divorce Statistics. It says, most people have heard the statistic that 50% of marriages end in divorce. Now this is in the United States, okay? This is not globally. This is dealing with U.S. Uh, that stat originated in the 1980s, and researchers believe the rate of divorce has since steadily dropped. Today, it is thought approximately 42 to 45 percent of marriages in the United States end in divorce. This does not include legal separations. It also does not include common law marriages. There's a, a trend that has been gaining steam since the 60s, and it's, it's actually uh, kind of interesting because um, since the 60s, uh, couples have decided not to marry and just live together to see how it works out. And um, ironically, today, the, the the demographic that that is most prevalent in is the Golden Agers. Because if the Golden Agers get married, the government starts messing with their money. And so they choose not to get married, they just live together. So, the way this is broken down, 42 to 45 percent of first time marriages end in divorce. Okay, that's, that's for first timers. 60% of second marriages end in divorce. 73% of third marriages end in divorce. That trend should make you perk up and listen. Now, this was a general study. Uh, I went and looked at numerous websites as to how that number relates to the church. And here's what I found. Depending on the author of the particular article, it ranged from about 12% to about 60% of marriages in the church and in divorce. Um, the trend being up right about 45%, but if you look at the statistics and how you interpret the statistics, Christians look at the studies and they say, well, they're not really talking about true believers. They're talking about people that mark, yeah, I'm a Christian because I'm an American. They have never shown any fruit. They've never shown any commitment. They've never spoken out as being a Christian. The Bible does not affect their lives. They, they uh, what do you call them, Dennis? Priesters? Priesters <laughs> that might go to church at Christmas and Easter. Okay? So, so they say that, you know, you, once you exclude that demographic, the numbers come significantly further down. Now, if you read uh, statistics from people that are uh, not believers, those numbers creep steadily up until you get to people that are anti-believers, and then they just kind of go through the roof. And, and one uh, document that I read said that uh, in the church, and they actually broke it down by um, different denominations, um, you have about 62% of believers that are getting divorced. And the highest number in that demographic was the Baptist church, which was right at 62%. Now, the Baptists say those numbers are all wrong. The atheists say, no, they're right. Here's, here's the deal. I can see no discernible difference between marriages and divorces in the church and those outside the church. Okay? Divorce is something we don't like to talk about in the church. Why? Because a lot of us have been divorced. Okay? So, I went through scripture and, and like I said, over the 
the last year, I've been pulling some scriptures out, and I've been putting them, I've been pondering them. I've been trying to come to an understanding because God actually speaks a lot about divorce throughout his word. God has very definite opinions about divorce in his word. Okay? So, Deuteronomy 24, go ahead and flip there if you would. We're just going to read over these scriptures, and then I want to talk to you a little bit. This is the establishment of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 24. <clears throat> When a man takes a wife, starting in, in verse 1, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because, she is, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife, after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Wow. Okay. Now, this, this deals with both divorce and and with uh, remarriage, okay? Now, I, I read this one first because this one is actually referred to in the New Testament, okay? So, just a couple things I want to say here. Um, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and he finds, she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. Indecency, there's not a good word translation for indecency other than somehow or another she was indecent. Okay? That could be entirely up to the husband what he considers indecent. Okay? She burned my dinner. <coughs> Every night for 12 years, she burned my dinner. Okay? But see, that the problem is um, it doesn't specify what the conditions are for the divorce. All it says is that if she is... Uh, she's got no favor in his eyes, so he hands her a certificate of divorce. Okay? So, you know, um, quite honestly, um, that really didn't put women in a very secure position, did it? It didn't. Um, so jumping up, I'm going to go way ahead to Malachi. Um, Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. Now, I was very disappointed in a number of the translations how they rendered this passage. Um, somebody here read uh, Malachi chapter 2 verse 16. Tell me the, the edition that you have, the version that you have, and then read it for me. And IV says, the man who hates and divorces his wife says, the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect. Okay, hold on. Start over again. The man who hates and divorces his wife says, the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, stop right there. Who hates who? The man hates his wife. Okay, that's not a correct translation. Somebody else. New King James Version. Go ahead. For the Lord, the God of Israel, said that he hates putting away. For one covers violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. Who hates what? The Lord hates the person putting them away. Hates, he hates the putting away of yeah. the person. Okay, somebody else. ESV. Somebody have ESV. What do you have? I have NIV. Okay. I hate divorce, says the Lord of Israel, and I hate a man covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says okay. the Lord Almighty. Okay. Who hates what? God hates divorce. Now look, I, I looked this up in the Hebrew. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Okay. Directly translated, he, being God, hates the putting on. The, the, the separation, the divorce. Okay. He hates it. 
Why does he hate it? Well, when God established marriage, um, what did he say would happen between the husband and the wife? The two become one. Last year, it was right about this time, Mackenzie had this great idea that she was going to make sugar cookies and the kids were going to decorate them. Wow. It was in my house that this thing happened. And we took some videos of it and, um, you know, they had the little snowmen and the little stars and lots of, of frosting and um, I was watching because most of the kids would take a particular color and they would put it in a particular spot on the cookie. You know, they would take yellow and they would fill in the star with yellow. Um, they would take white and they would fill in the snowman with white. But Judah took some blue and some red and he mixed them together on the cookie. Now what happens when you mix blue and red? Purple. Purple. Something new comes out of the two that has <coughs> semblance from both. Declan looked across at what Judah was doing and flipped out. <coughs> If one of these days, if you have opportunity, ask Christy to show you the video. It was hysterical. Okay? This is similar. This is just an illustration of what happens when God takes a man and a woman and he brings them together as a couple, the two become one. What would happen if Judah decided he didn't like the blue on his cookie? What could he do? Eat the cookie. He gave the cookie to me and I ate it. <laughs> because the blue and the red didn't taste any different when they were mixed together. Okay? But he couldn't separate the blue from the red. Because the two had become one. Okay? So, why does God hate divorce? I can think of a number of reasons why God hates divorce. He doesn't tell us exactly why he hates it. But he does. I can look at families that have been dis divorced and I can see some of the terrible things that have come out of it. Now, I'm going to back up and I want to start with this. I am not speaking to any one person in here. Okay? When I'm looking around, I am not looking at any one of your faces. I'm trying to find dead spots <laughs> because I don't want anyone going, why did he look at me when he said that? Okay? I do not come up to the pulpit and address a personal issue with someone, okay? If there's an issue between me and you, something that I feel like needs to be addressed, I'll come to you, okay? The only time it would ever come up here is if there was a situation of sin that you had been addressed privately, you had been addressed by several people privately, and you still repented and we had to bring it before the church. That's the only time that's going to happen. Okay. In the six plus years that I've been here, we have not had to do that. Not once. Okay. So when I'm speaking today, I'm not addressing any of you personally. I'm speaking about the issue. Okay. Now, it's not up to me what God does with you with this. Okay. Now, all I've got to do is be faithful to say what he's given me to say. Okay. And then I entrust you to him that he would do whatever needs to be done. Okay? So, God hates divorce. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about the law. And he says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, here we see one of the reasons, uh, actually Jesus is clarifying one of the reasons that divorce is accepted. It's actually called the exception rule. Okay? 
when God is uh, laying out, you know, marriage is one and done, there, this is the exception. Sexual immorality, it doesn't say specifically what the immorality is. Okay? We don't know exactly what falls into the acceptable group of Im sexual immorality. We, we don't have that clue. Okay? Um, but hold that thought because I'm going to jump down to Matthew 19. I'm sorry, Matthew 5, that was verses 31 and 32 for those that uh, were writing it down. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Okay? Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay, so he's giving them the answer. And the Pharisees are trying to pin him down. So they said to him, why, did, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Now listen to what Jesus said. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Then uh, the passage goes on, and the disciples say, well, then it's better that a man not marry. And Jesus says, uh, well, yeah, not everyone can receive this teaching. Okay? Now, again, he uses the sexual imm immorality clause, the, the exception. Okay? I, I don't know. Um what that exception would be. I know a lot of different things that fall under sexual immorality. Adultery is right there at the top of the list. Um, as I was looking up statistics, one of the things that I found that was rather interesting is that uh, Facebook is not a good thing for married people. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, they, they say about 60% of the divorces, I think the number was 63% of the divorces started because of a, a, an online relationship and the spouse found out about it. And so um, actually Facebook has been used increasingly in divorce cases and settlements to prove wrongdoing. Okay, um, We have got to be also very careful Oh, so very careful what we bring into our home. Okay. Pornography. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, um, I tell you the truth. If a man looks at a woman lustfully, he has already sinned. Okay. Because sin is something that is birthed in the heart before it ever comes out in the flesh. Okay? It, it's already there. You just haven't acted on it. But if you're dwelling on it and you're, uh, you know, teasing with it, you're in deep water. Be very careful. You're in deep water and there's sharks. Okay? So what, what the sexual immorality is, we don't have a good definition. 
Okay? And it could be very different from one couple to another couple. I don't know. So, Jesus says, Moses allowed them to do a certificate of divorce, not because it was good, but because it was uh, the, the hardness of heart. Uh, all you got to do is read throughout the, the Old Testament, and you're going to see that the Jews were a stiff-necked, hard-headed people. Okay? They, they wanted things their way, and, and there were certain things that were allowed that uh, I don't think it was in God's heart to allow them, but because of who they were, he gave them grace. Okay, so we have this uh, understanding that one, God hates divorce, but he also has given us an exception whereby the marriage can be annulled for a particular reason, sexual immorality. Um, Paul gives us another reason, okay? These are the only two reasons that I could find in Scripture for divorce. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to, in any way, dig into anybody's divorce. Because I know uh, from some of your testimonies, some of the, the very difficult things that you've gone through. Okay? So I'm, I'm not making a, a moral judgment on your circumstance all I'm doing is relaying to you what God's Word says. Okay? Um, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul uh, deals with the, the issue of marriage. Chapter 7. I'm going to pick up in verse 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 deals a lot with how God desires marriages to work. It gives us a, a, a pretty solid guideline that we can judge how our relationship is. Okay, I'm going to pick up down in verse 10. Um, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, verse 11. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord. Now that's an interesting little parenthetical statement. So can we ignore this right here because Paul wrote it? Why not? I mean, it, it, it's pretty clear God's not talking. Paul is. Why, why can we choose not to ignore this? Well, very simply because God put it in his word. Paul may have had some very clear things from God that he needed to tell the church, but something that he thought was his that he told the church, God said, no, you guys need to hear this. So God put it in here. All of it's his word. Nothing is in here by accident. Okay? To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, verse 15. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or the sister is not enslaved, God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, Paul goes on to say uh, quite a bit further down in this, but basically the, the, the sum of the rest of this passage is live in the state you're in. Okay? 
If you're married, live married. If you're divorced, live divorced. Now, did you catch the second exception in here? The first exception is sexual immorality. The second section, the, the second exception is if the unbelieving spouse desires to leave. Okay? The unbelieving spouse. Okay? I, these are the only two things I can see in Scripture where God allows divorce in light of New Testament reading. Okay? Now, when God brings a couple together, now let me, let me say this. Um, I don't believe that every person has one person out there for them. Okay? I, I don't believe that. I don't hold to that thinking. I believe that God gives us freedom to choose and God already knows who we will choose. And the moment you say, I do, that's the one person for you. Okay? Up to that point, it could be this or that or the other. But at that point, I do, that's the one for you. And God already knew it beforehand. He wasn't surprised. Okay? So, we have... Um, Satch, would you bring my water, please? We have the first exception, which is sexual immorality. The second exception, if the unbelieving spouse desires to depart. So, where does that leave us in America? Because in America, um, you know, if we go with conservative, very conservative numbers, uh, one in ten people is either divorced or going to get divorced. If we go with the liberal numbers, six out of 10. We have a problem in the church in America. Now, again, please don't feel like I'm judging you. I don't know what precipitated uh, the divorces and most of the people in here that are divorced. I have no idea. I know some of the things. And I know some of you were put in some pretty horrific positions, okay? Remember what I said at the start? What did I say at the start? No condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? So I don't want you walking around because the enemy can take this and start whispering in your ear. See? You don't deserve. See, you're a horrible person. You can't even be a good Christian because that's a lie. That's deception and that's a lie. Okay? His grace exceeds your sin. God saw what was going on. He knew what was going to happen. He paid the price. Okay? But we have an epidemic in the church that in this area, we can see no discernible difference between a believer and a non-believer. <coughs> what did Jesus say would let people know that uh, they were his disciples? Love one for another. Love one for another. No. I don't believe all you need is love. I think that's a stupid song. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't believe it. Okay? Because people tend to associate love with that emotional high when all the endorphins are kicking in and you're first dating. And guess what? After about three months, that leaves. And if that's what you're looking at, in three months, you're up a creek because the goody goody feelings have gone away. Okay? What I believe that that marriage takes is work. And it takes both people to work. Amen. Not just one. One person that is willing to work can do incredible things, but ultimately it takes both. Okay? So, divorce. What, what do we do with divorce? Uh, I want to share with you a, a dilemma that has plagued the church for years. It's become more of a, an issue today than it was previously, but um, 
Paul writes to Timothy. Actually, it's Timothy and Titus. They're called the pastoral letters because uh, Paul is writing to them how to be a pastor. He's giving them advice, <coughs> giving them some guidelines. And one of the things that they were responsible for, both Titus and Timothy, was appointing elders and deacons in the church. Okay. Um, as such, Paul says that there were certain qualifications for elder and certain qualifications for deacon. Now, essentially, the, the two words, uh, the two positions amount to almost the same thing. But the calling of each is different. Okay? Um, we see in the ministry and the life of Jesus that he established those that were called to be apostles. The main focus of their task, uh, we see in Acts, was to pray and to preach. That, that was where the, the apostles, they were to focus. Now, I believe that elders are going to be those who are called to pray and to preach. Ephesians chapter 4, it lists the fivefold ministry gifts in the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. In each of those cases, those people are called to teach in some way. Deacons, who are held to the same measure as elders aren't necessarily called to preach and teach. They can, but that's not their primary calling. What is the primary calling of a deacon? A deacon is somebody who, having the same attributes as an elder, looks after the physical needs of the church while the elder looks after the spiritual needs. There's no difference in the qualifications called for one to the other, with one exception. The elders are called to be able to teach. Okay. So, Paul writes this uh, to Timothy. Um, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Go ahead and turn there. He has some things to say about this. I'm going to start in verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drinker, drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now this is the qualifications for overseers. Again, those whose focus in the church is the spiritual side of things. Okay? Now we have uh, the qualifications for deacons. Does everybody know what uh, a deacon means? It comes from the Greek word diakonos. Does anybody know what that means? Minister or servant. You got a cheat sheet. <laughs> it, it literally means someone who waits on you. Not like, dear, we're late, we gotta go. I mean like somebody that waits and brings you the things that you need. A servant, okay? And we see in, in the establishment of the office of deacon, uh, if you go back into Acts, we see that certain of the church um, that were not Jews, they, were, they called them the Greeks, um, were not getting uh, the help they needed from the church. Well, the, the apostles got together and they said, it's not right, this is, this is not something we should be focusing our energy on, but we need somebody to do it. And so they took seven men who had these qualifications, and told them, it's your responsibility to see that this is done. Okay? That's where we get deacon. All right? So, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, nor greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. 
Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Okay, so did you see the one message about marriage in here? Here's a dilemma that has plagued the church for years. What does one wife mean? At a time. <laughs> That's actually one of the answers. One wife at a time. Yeah, one, one of the answers is they, they can't be a bigamist or a, 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 a polygamist. Okay? One wife at a time. The problem is what constitutes a wife. Because we see in the, the passage that uh, Jesus gave that I, I read to you a little bit ago in uh, Matthew 19 uh, and Matthew 5, and then we see what uh, Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. We see that there are stipulations. Now, um, quite honestly, I have not made up my mind exactly about what this means. Okay? I see the value of both of the positions. You have one position that, that simply, quite simply says, one wife at a time. This passage does not address necessarily those that have been divorced. However, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, he makes it clear, um, I'm sorry, in Romans, uh, I lost my place. I believe it's Romans, Five. Did I read Romans 5? I might not have read no. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. let's, let's go over there real quick. I'm going to touch on this just really quickly. Romans chapter 5. <coughs> that's not it. I did read that one, but that's not what I was thinking. You had eight. You know, I prayed this morning that God would not let me say anything I wasn't supposed to say. So I'm going to take this as God's way of telling me I don't need to say this. <laughs> Yay, God. Here's, here's where we're at. Paul writes, and he says, that the only dissolution to the covenant of marriage is death. That's, that's it. That's what dissolves that covenant. Okay? Because in God's eyes, the two became one. And just like Judah couldn't separate the, the, the red from the blue, there are things that happen in the spiritual realm when a husband and a wife become one. Okay? Now, uh, the other position as far as elders and overseers, with the understanding that the two become one flesh and that... <clears throat> Uh, the only dissolution of that covenant is death. The other side of the coin to this, this issue for deacons and elders is they can't be divorced and remarried. Okay? Because then you would have two wives. Because the first covenant, if your spouse was alive, uh, your ex-spouse was alive, uh, you wouldn't be able to serve as a, an elder or a deacon until the passing of your spouse. Now, that is not excuse for anyone to take things in their own hand and speed up their, their demise. Okay, because that would fall in violation of several other requirements. Okay. So here's what I want you to take away from this. Okay. I know a number of you have been divorced. I know a number of you have been divorced several times. I know a number of you have been divorced and remarried. God, he, his grace exceeds that. You live in the state you're in right now. Okay. And you understand 
that God's grace is bigger than your sin. Now, as far as the, the running of the church, we've actually talked about this in, in leadership a couple of times. Um, I, I honestly can't say I have a good feeling about either position because I think in each case, we have to make excuse for some passage of scripture. <clears throat> and I don't think scripture should ever be excused. Okay. Um, if you are divorced and remarried, God will still use you. God will still use you. Be faithful. He still has a place for you. You're not the redheaded stepchild. God's love for you is not going to change. It's not going to diminish in any way. Okay? Because when Jesus went to the cross, he already knew where you were going to be today. And he accepted that and covered that with his blood. Okay? So, in the church, there has got to be a significant difference in how we handle our relationships and how the world handles our relationships. One of the sad things that I read uh, in scripture, the, the Baptists had the highest number of divorce rate of the churches that were listed. Um, one of the reasons that that was so is that um, because of the hard hardness of the church, people didn't feel like they were accepted because of what had happened in their marriage. You know, as a pastor, my goal is to help your marriage become the absolute best it could ever be. Walking with you through it and helping you understand that, that even in the midst of ugliness, God can still move. Okay. Despite that position, I understand sometimes that things don't work out the way we think they should. And I want us to be a church that is willing to band together to uphold that to those that are going through hardship, that we would be inclusionary, not exclusionary. Okay? Now, I don't want that to be an excuse to sin. I don't. Don't take that. Pastor Glenn said it was okay. la di da Because it's not before me you have to stand judged. It's before our Father. Okay? So, um, marriage is a blessed thing. Sin sucks. That's about it. Okay? 